Good morning, everybody. We will start the inaugural monthly webinar now. Um, my name is Linda Westfall. I am in charge of the National School Lunch Program and PEBT. Sorry. Uh, we will start the webinar. I will give you the agenda, and I hope everybody is having a good start to the school year as best as we can hope for. So the agenda, we will have TJ going over uh, renewal announcements and some of the USDA food supply chain issues. I will go over the monitoring waiver and administrative review. Kat Forsty will go over some procurement um, things that she's seen. And then I will finish the webinar with uh, PEBT new information that I'd like to update as many people on as possible. So I will let TJ take it over from now. Thank you. And just a confirmation you can hear me. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. There's a couple of things that we wanted to just remind folks about. We've been having this conversation for quite some time, and it's just reminding everyone about the seamless summer option for school year 21-22. So what we need to make sure is everyone is fully aware that operating under seamless summer is an option for school year 21-22. It's highly encouraged for many reasons, but we need to make sure that everyone is aware of what needs to occur. So you need to make sure that you have seamless summer option site applications set up in two places in My Idaho CMP. They need to be set up for operations under the 2020-2021 application packet and the 2021-2022 application packet in My Idaho CMP. Keep in mind your claims will be submitted through SSO site rather than through the school nutrition program claiming area. Melissa has provided instructions on how to submit those claims on the um, My Idaho CMP when you log in on the message board. But if you have questions regarding submitting your claims, please make sure to reach out to our claiming financial specialist, Melissa Cook. Also keep in mind that you will be receiving claim rates at $4.31. So here's what we need you to know if you have not already completed all these steps. The state agency provided a stepwise um, instructional resource for how to ensure you've met all of the requirements under renewal for the school year 21-22. First, you need to make sure that you've updated the 2020-2021 application packet. You need to make sure that you've added the month of August and September if you had school beginning in August or, of course, September, if you didn't start school until September, and that your end date is September 30th, 2021. If you use the resource that was provided, the title behind step one is actually a hyperlink with a video tutorial on exactly what you need to do. I think most people have completed that process and been approved. It's important because you cannot submit an August claim if you haven't completed that step one. Step two is to ensure that you have completed the school year 21-22 school meals opt-in waiver form. You must tell the state agency what your operational plans for the school year 21-22 are. Again, the title on the resource that was provided is a hyperlink directly into the form. So once you click on the title, you complete the form. It's really important to note that if you submitted that form prior to maybe some issues occurring in your school, like having to shut down for a COVID response, and you need to edit the opt-in form that you previously submitted, please don't resubmit a brand new form. What we need you to do is pull up the form you previously submitted and use the edit feature. On the form you received via email, there is the word edit. You click on the word edit and it hyperlinks you into your previous form. As far as step three is concerned, 
you must take the authorized mandatory training, which is titled 2021 Navigating School Nutrition Program Training. That includes anybody who actually participated in our new food service director training. While we appreciate that you participated in that, you need to take the 2021 Navigating School Training. It's important that you do that because we need to have your certificate of completion uploaded into the checklist summary of your 2021-2022 application packet. All of that is covered under step four, enroll in the 2021-2022 application packet instruction, which again, there is a hyperlink on that title with a video tutorial. So if you watch those video resources, there's no reason why you can't successfully complete your renewal process. So moving on from then, there, if you haven't done all of those steps, please get to those immediately because it's important that we get renewal behind us. We have operations to take care of. School year has officially started. Instructions for setting up SFA sites. We do know that there are some people that may have to set up different sites. Let's say you've opened an alternative school for this year or something along those lines. Please make sure that you um, add a site. If you need help with any of those features in My Idaho CMP, Melissa Cook, who is our planning specialist, can help you with that. Or contact the individual who's been sending you lots of emails reminding you to please complete renewal this year. So you should know who that individual is. If you don't, happy to guide you to that particular person for individual attention. It's important to note that you have to do all steps in your 21-22 renewal packet. You can't skip over any of these steps or you will not get the submit or approval button. Look at that big red button and click it, otherwise we cannot approve your renewal submission. And with that, we'll move on to, this is what the waiver opt-in form looks like. If you go to that form and complete it, you will get an email notification with the completed responses attached. You will need to make sure that you upload into your 2021-2022 application packet in the attachment list a completed version of your responses to the waiver opt-in form. It's the only way we at the state agency know what waivers you've opted into for the school year. And again, if you need to edit it, go to your received response and click the word edit. Moving on, let's talk a little bit about supply chain issues. Um, this has not been a pretty year to start, and I do not suspect it's going to get better anytime soon. So you need to be, um, you're probably already aware, but if you're not, you need to be paying particular attention to how your USDA foods are being impacted. When it comes to your commercial procurement, obviously that's not something that the state agency can control, but we need to point you in the right direction. So first, what do we know about supply chain disruptions? What we know is that there have been multitudes of loads that were not purchased due to crop issues or vendor constraints. So just like you're hearing from your commercial vendors, the USDA food that were supposed to be purchased have been impacted. They either had to go out to rebid on products because they couldn't get vendors or there have been delays in delivery. So really pay attention to what is happening. And how do you pay attention to those things? You need to make sure that you are looking at all of the information that's provided to you. We currently know that there were fruit orders and orange juice orders that were not bid on for the October through December period. That's going to impact many of you. And what has occurred as a result of that is USDA will go back out to bid, but the soonest we'll have delivery on those products is going to be early 2022. So that's going to change some of the ways that you had planned to utilize your USDA foods, and it's going to choose, uh, potentially change items that you had previously menued. 
We know that some orders of USDA foods, truckloads, are not delivering on the dates that they were requested for delivery. So we may have requested an August 15th delivery. Some of those loads are currently sitting in undelivered status, and the state agency has reached out to USDA and said, where are they? What can we plan for? What can we expect? We've gotten updates on some of them. Um, many of them have since delivered, but many of them have not, and we are waiting additional information. I did receive not the best of news yesterday that USDA anticipates that there will not be a delivery on some of our products that we've been waiting on. So we will keep you advised, but it's, it's really a systematic approach um, to just finding out one load at a time, what's coming, what's not, when can we expect it, and then we'll keep you informed. We do know that we've had two of our manufacturers who further process items for us. They've issued very significant notices. Those notices included increased pricing for our further processed end products. They've included notices of reformulated products Specifically, some of the Tyson products will now have higher um, contributions of soy flour. That may change how you're able to menu those products. The state agency did push back on when they once wanted to institute this change in pricing because fortunately they had a contract to protect us for 90 days, but that is coming down the line. We also received notification from Cargill that they are pausing production lines for um, some specific products. So one of the products that we know will be um, impacted is our, um, I'm drawing a blank, it is our um, French toast sticks. So Cargill received the liquid eggs to produce our French toast sticks. And some of their individually wrapped items and bulk items are currently under pause production. And the reason for that is they don't have the capacity to fully produce products and they're having to determine what products are most beneficial. So we don't really have a say so in the matter. We just know what is coming down the line. So please be prepared. So let's talk a little bit more now about what can we do since we know what we know. What we can do is pay really close attention to all of the automated web SEM sales order change notifications. You get those because you placed requisitions for specific items. You need to be watching those notifications for what is happening. You need to look very deliberately at the product number of the product and the product description. And you need to pay attention to the update columns. What is it telling you? Was there a change to the expected delivery date? or did the status of the product change? They list an old value, which may have said something along the lines of um, purchased, and then the new value might say that it's been kicked back to S&S and A&S. What that means is that they don't know if we're gonna get delivery of the product. So you need to really pay attention to those web SEM notifications. They're your tool to success so that you can start planning immediately. You also need to consistently run a requisition status report in WebSCM so that you can view any applicable order changes to your requisition products. Watch for changes in delivery date. Watch for purchased items. Watch to see if items have actually been received at the warehouse. All of that information lives on your requisition status report. So if you're going to have to start switching up menus, you need to know on a regular basis where your product lives and what you can expect. Also make sure that you are paying close attention to all the broadcast emails that are sent by our USDA Foods team. We are working really, really hard to keep you updated, but it is incredibly time intensive to have one of my team members receive an email from someone about a USDA foods that they then have to forward to me, that I then have to reference a, a, a broadcast email that was sent out two or three days ago or a week ago. 
we really need you guys to be diligent about watching for notifications for us. And if you suspect you're not receiving our notifications, please talk to your IT folks and let them know, hey, I've got to know that this information is coming down the pipe because we have limited capacity here in the state agency too. And we want to provide really deliberate on-time customer service, but we're being stretched to the limit, folks. And we just need you to do your, you know, your due diligence to pay attention to those notifications. Also, can you take, pay very, yes. Can Go I ahead, just inter interject for one moment on that? Please remember when you are sending questions, Please make your question as detailed as possible. Some people are just asking one line questions and, and it takes longer to try to figure out what you're asking so that we can provide an answer for you. So when you do send us questions, please make sure that you're, you're expressing what you really are needing so we can help you hopefully quicker. Thank you, Kat. That's really instrumental to your success and ours. So thank you for that input. And to, to tag on to that, you need to make sure that your USDA foods questions are directed to the USDA foods team at sde.idaho.gov. We are your first line of defense, so you need to direct those to us. Even if you have an established relationship with somebody else in our office, while we appreciate that, it's the USDA foods team who is ultimately going to be able to answer your questions. So thank you for that instruction, Kat, I appreciate that. And then also, if you are in need of foods, USDA foods have been delayed and you need to find, okay, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna handle this? And your commercial vendor maybe doesn't have the capacity you need. Don't forget the exchange. The exchange document is where we list all available inventory. There's a lot of product on there that is listed on the bonus tab. It's carryover from last school year, meaning it is sitting in our warehouse, ready for someone to claim it, to go into Iris and to ask for a delivery of it, and then it's there for you to utilize. So please make sure you're looking at the exchange. Also, make sure that you're paying attention to all the other tabs. We have a surplus tab. We have a surrender tab. And we have a sweeps tab. If product's on there and you claim it, you will need to release it in IRIS. It's a two-step process. We need to make that really clear. But also pay attention to the delivery date on the exchange. Those delivery dates are there for a reason. If you claim product that's not going to be delivered until October, you will not see it in IRIS for delivery to your facility until the product is received at the warehouse. So all of that information you really got to look at and make sure that you understand how it all works together. Our next advice is be prepared to pivot. I know you guys are really, really good at this and you're probably tired of having to do it, but at this point, I think we're gonna be spending 360s. We're gonna pivot and pivot and pivot and pivot until we can just make sure that food that foods are being served to children. So what does that mean? How do I manage that? Have you considered having a manager's choice menu option if you, if you offer multiple entrees? Because a manager's choice allows you to plug in whatever is available so long as it meets the menu requirement. So let's say you planned on chicken nuggets, but hey, your chicken nuggets didn't arrive. Do you have fajita meat? Do you have chicken fajita meat that you can plug in and somehow utilize in a manager's choice menu so that you're serving a compliant daily and weekly menu? Likely that you do. So keep all of that in mind and really, really be aware of your commercially procured products in conjunction with your USDA foods. Are you utilizing your USDA DOD produce allocations? Don't let that sit because that can be a really great way to solve. Maybe you feel like your kids are really tired of green beans. Get them some fresh, or I'm sorry, <laughs> canned fruit, because we're not gonna substitute can, canned fruit for, um, fruit for raw fruit. But if they're tired of canned fruit, 
can you use your DOD produce and get some apples or oranges or some other produce in so that you can alternate that product? Make sure you're looking at your DOD produce. And then, of course, use substitutions when needed and plan for using basic ingredients. That's what's gonna get you through this year. Yes, we know that children like to have choice, but we're all under constraint. And at the end of the day, what we really need to make sure is those kids are having access to healthy, wholesome meals. They might be tired of receiving the same things, but are we getting them the nutrients that they need? That's what we really need to focus on, the objective of the programs for this school year. Also, if you run into a problem, make sure that you submit that school year 21-22 meal pattern waiver flexibility request. Now, keep in mind that if you can't meet part of the meal pattern, the state agency needs to know because we cannot allow you to claim a non-reimbursable meal. But I have heard from some folks that say, I don't think I'm going to have enough meat to feed all of my children the daily requirements. We need to know that, so submit your meal pattern flexibility request. We know that sodium's an issue. If you have to go with individually wrapped, it's gonna be a bigger issue. So keep all of that in mind, that's a flexibility. Also, review your existing contracts and work towards solutions. This is a stakeholder game. You have got to be engaged with every one of your vendors, find out where they're at, have honest conversations, let them know what your needs are. And then, of course, use emergency procurement as needed. It is not a blank check, but you can use it if you need it. And if you have questions about emergency procurement, Kat is going to go over some of those in our webinar today. And then, of course, communicate with your administration. You are doing a job that is not easy during a time of crisis. Let your administration know your success depends on their willingness to communicate to the parents in your community and the students in your community. It is not by choice that you may have to reconfigure your menus on a regular basis, but your administration has got to have your back. So make sure that you have those conversations. And if there's any way the state agency can support you, we need to know about that, so please let us know. And with that, we'll now turn the time over to, I believe, Linda, or is it Kat? Is Kat? No, it's gonna be Linda. She's gonna talk about the monitoring waiver. So thank you for, for your time and attention. Thank you, TJ. One thing that I forgot to bring up at the beginning is there is a Q&A tab at the bottom for anybody to use to ask questions that we will answer at the end of this webinar. So if you have any questions while we're talking, please enter the, them into the Q&A bullet uh, at the bottom of the screen. So I'm gonna talk about the monitoring waiver. The monitoring waiver allows you or SFA to conduct the required SSO offsite review or conduct the review offsite. It's either on site or offsite, but they must be conducted. And in download forms under zero COVID, so they're the first two um, forms we have how to do the SSO monitoring review and the USDA SSO review form up there. You do have to do it. They have to, um, it's for all SFAs operating the seamless summer option. You have to do it at least once during the operation. Uh, a checklist is required form to complete and document the review. We've had a few questions that the monitoring waiver meant you could ask for it, and that meant the state would not come out and do a review. That is not the case. The monitoring waiver is strictly for doing the review on site is what is expected, but if something were to happen or you want to stay in your office, you could do the monitoring waiver off site. 
that's uh, what I wanted to talk to you about the monitoring waiver. Now we have what I'm referring to as the pizza dilemma. So we have a lot of people who um, contract out with companies for pizza, and they've been asking for a, a waiver for the whole grain crust of the pizza. What we've determined on a lot of these pizza requests is Yes, they're asking for the whole grain rich versus a regular pizza crust, but they're not taking into consideration the cheese. So in this uh, scenario, we have a pizza that's cheese that's a whole grain crust. It meets the requirements, which you can see by the next slide, looking at calories, saturated fat, and sodium. So in the next slide, everything is pretty close. We're um, 16 calories off, which USDA allows to be a little bit over. That's okay. But when we get to the next one, the calories on the pizza go up because they are offering a non whole grain crust, and they might have changed the ingredients a little bit. So if you're asking for pepperoni pizza, and the pepperoni is not CN labeled, they can't count that in there. So the calories suddenly get out of the range, and there is no waiver for calories, or saturated fat. Saturated fat is within range, but what we want you to be aware of um, on the next slide is there are three different types of cheeses being used on pizzas. And granted, they may only be 20 calories different, but that 20 calories may, may bop you out of the calorie range. Uh, so one is reduced fat, one is regular, and one is whole milk um, cheese for the pizza. One saturated fat, it goes from 2.5 to 4.5. So it's up two grams, goes from 13% to 23. Just wanted to make people aware, if you're asking for the crust being non-whole grain, you may want to ask about the cheese portion of the pizza as well, and be very mindful of your calories and saturated fat. Because if you are top, towards the top of that, this may make you out of compliance with um, changing your pizza up like that. And we have discovered that in one in another who is very good with um, monitoring their calories. They uh, knew that it would get them higher, but they would be in the range of calories. All right, next is administrative review. We did send out, most people sent out to their reviewees uh, the review form checklist and an admin review guidebook. So it tells you step by step in the admin review module guidebook. This is the question we're asking. Please, this is what we're, we're trying to get you to answer. So how is the relationship, um, what is the relationship for, for, um, wellness policy committee members. And what answer we're looking for is, this is the health teacher, the superintendent, that type of thing. We have had the answer, what's the relationship? Good. I'm not sure that that's helpful in a review situation. We really want to know what the relationship is to the district. So the health teacher or a parent could be involved and it could be a fifth grade parent. Those are the answers that we're looking for. So we were trying to help you know what it is we're looking for in a, an administrative review, which will bring me full circle to renewal. You have to have 
your 21-22 applications approved to be able to get the review added to the um, review portion, the compliance. And we really need uh, those of you who are having a review to, I'm sort of asking nicely, please focus on getting all of your um, applications in so we can start the review process and not be behind the eight ball with reviews. The other thing is in compliance, under the sites that are chosen, the meal compliance risk assessment tool, there is a question under one, it says seamless summer option. We want you all that are doing seamless summer and we hope that's everybody to get the higher amount. We want you to answer that yes. And answering it yes does give you five extra points, but depending on the answers to all of the other questions that may not make a, a difference in the um, total score. And if it, if it does, we will individually contact you on the admin review. So if you have any questions on the administrative review or any of the information that we sent out about that, please contact the person that sent you the email. That would be the head of your review and they can answer any questions. We have moved reviews a little earlier this year to try to get ahead of the game. We have 34 reviews and we do know that we know per the Farmer's Almanac, it's supposed to not be a very nice year and we want to be out and about while it's not a raging blizzard in November and December. So hopefully um, that will help you as well because school won't be canceled for that one reason, might be canceled for other reasons, but that I, we can't control at all. Uh, finally, for the admin review, let us know if there is something um, COVID related that we need to do. If your school is closing everything up to outside visitors, we're going to have to reschedule your review. If the school wants us to wear certain types of masks, let us know and we will wear those masks. Any constraints you have, talk to your administrators and let us know. We wanna follow everything and be as safe as you wanna be in your office as well. So that would be it for the administrative review. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kat to talk to you about procurement. Hi, everybody. Um, I feel a little bit like I'm the least favorite person right now in child nutrition because I am going forward with procurement reviews. Uh, the procurement review schedule this year is ahead of the AR review. So if you had a procurement review last year, you're probably getting in there this year. And so I'm a year ahead with my procurement reviews. So just to let you know that mine done offsite, I won't be coming to your school. Everything will be done through communication with you. Um, call me or you know, email me if you have questions. I'm always happy to help walk you through anything. The first thing I'll talk about is capital expenditure requests. I can't emphasize enough how much importance you need to put on getting that prior approval. If you go out and purchase a large item and you don't get prior approval, and it's not something that the state agency could approve for you, you're gonna to have to go back to your general funds to pay for that. So it's, it's very important that you get prior approval, that you go out and you get your bids and you do your due diligence. It's also very important that you include your equal or equivalent language. If you don't put in equal or equivalent, you may be asked to go back out for bids or quotes. This is something that if a, a vendor got a hold of information that Perhaps they didn't get a chance to bid for an item that's similar, not necessarily to say it's the one you would choose because it won't do everything you ask for. You still have to give a vendor the ability to bid an item that could be a lower price. And maybe it's not quite what you're looking for, but you still need to give them that option. I remember that all purchases need to be allowable, necessary, and allocable. So you need to upload your bids into my Idaho CNP. 
Um, the best thing you can do is just send me a quick email and say, hey, I submitted a request that makes me be able to get in there and look at it quicker. I'll be honest with you. I'm part of the PEBT team, the USDA foods team, and I'm doing procurement reviews. So I'm only checking about once a week just to make sure I haven't missed anyone. So if you're gonna submit a request, please, please let me know. That just helps me get in there quicker. I wanna talk a little bit about the co-op purchasing. Um, as procurement reviews are progressing, there is a section, if you belong to a co-op, you can check in my Idaho CNP. So what's going on with the, with the procurement in Idaho is that we are CMP program operator only cooperatives. We're not a group purchasing organization or a group buying organization. And I realize that when you check that box, it only gives you those options. So please, you can just choose either one group purchasing or group buying. I know that we're a CMP program operator only cooperative. Uh, a group purchasing organization would be an organization that can supply things for schools and law enforcement and universities and hospitals. Those are part of a group purchasing or group buying organization and Idaho does not have one of those. There is director of administration, department of administration that you can look at. And they do have some items. I believe they have uh, produce out there and maybe some office equipment. So, I mean, if you're stuck, I guess, you know, you can look at the Department of Administration and they do have a, a procurement section there. If you're choosing to belong to a co-op, which is great, but you decide you don't want to buy something from that bid and you're going to go out and just buy it somewhere else, please remember that when you do that, you need to properly procure. You can't just go and buy it somewhere else. You need to procure the item. And in doing some reviews last year, I was catching a few of those things. They were they were not purchasing what the co-op had. They were just going off and getting it somewhere else, perhaps at a lower price. But the co-op bids together, so everyone gets a decent price and gets a good you know price. But when you're going to go off on your own and do it, you're going to have to procure properly, and that's one thing I do look for. Procurement procedures and procurement bid information. I have been reviewing co-ops. Co-ops need to have the same information that a district would have. It just needs to pertain to the co-op. So you need to have procurement procedures in place with the required language. And when you have your procurement bids, they need to have all the proper information and all the regulations, but they need to pertain to the co-op. I have also seen some districts that are maybe taking the co-op procedures and using it as a template and making it their own, but they're forgetting in some areas to remove the co-op name. So it's kind of a mishmash of the school and the co-op. So make sure if you're gonna do that, you're gonna make sure to put your information. CFR says you must use your own information for your procurement policies. So procurement ponderings, sole source procurement and emergency purchase. I know that's a very um, relevant topic right now. Just please be mindful you need to at least go out and attempt to procure from, you know, if you can only get two or three bids out there and two come back and say, can't do it, please just document your reasons. You need to document why you only are able to go with that one vendor. And please remember to be flexible with your vendors. They are having problems as well. There's driver shortages, there's labor shortages, um, there's food you know, issues trying to get food. So just remember to be flexible. I did see in one area I was looking that a delivery time was listed as 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. I mean, that's kind of unrealistic really, you know, if a driver can't get there. So you'll wanna try to be flexible and work with your vendors. Keep each procurement unique. So check over the items and the pricing every year. Don't just use the same contract you've been using for five years and, and you know add a few new things that you want. By leaving the items on there you haven't used in a while, that's gonna be taxing on everybody. It's gonna be maybe hard to get the items. Maybe a vendor is gonna go, oh, well, I'll mark these items lower. They don't use those. And so I you know mark the ones that they use the most. And then what happens when you go in, your bid's gonna be lower for that particular vendor, but maybe because you had too many items on there that you weren't using. And that makes a vendor you know, unsure that you're gonna be able to fulfill your end too. So make sure you make each procurement unique, check your contracts every year. Make sure you have language in your RFP or your IFB 
for termination for cause or convenience. If your contract is over $10,000, you wanna make sure you have that language in there and you wanna document the reasons why. Uh, procedures for documenting pre-approval of any substitutions or deviations. That's very important right now. You're gonna to wanna to make sure you have that in there. A, a vendor may very well have to substitute something for you. So just make sure when you're going through your bids, you have that language in there. Only using one grocery store in an area. I know we've talked about this one before. If you only have one grocery store, you still need to call around and see about pricing. You can look online, you can call other markets. Um, if there's a market that's 45 minutes away from you that has a better price, you can still use the market in your area. Just make sure you're putting down that the cost of fuel and the effort and time you're spending to drive to the store and then drive back. Those are all good valid reasons for you know only using the market in your area. But again, everything comes down to documentation. You just need to make sure you keep a record of that. And procuring from local farms. Right now, produce, you know, whatever's in season, that's a great idea, but you can't just go to the farm and say, hey, I'm going to, you know, purchase all of this. What can you, you know, what kind of price can you give me? You still need to procure correctly. You need to go to two or three different areas. You need to check maybe produce delivery options in the town, maybe look at the grocery store. You still need to procure properly and, and still you can buy from your local farmer, but just make sure you're procuring in the proper way. So one good thing to do for procurement, you can use what we call the informal procurement form. And that's if you go into my at OCMP and go to section 18, and that's what it's called, informal procurement form. That lets you list down the vendors that you're talking to, the prices that you're getting. It helps can keep everything in order. And then that's just so quick and easy to upload into my at OCMP so that I can see that you, you did go out and do your due diligence and got your three bids or, or however many you were able to get and just let us know. There's also a procurement checklist I created for this year. It's something that helps you look at the procurement checklist, and then you'll be able to know the items that are required, the required federal language. I've listed out the CFRs in there. So it's just a, a way to help you look at your procurement policies and make sure that you're getting the required language in there. Um, I have been talking to some schools and they're telling me that they're new or that the food service director is new. It's unfortunate that you're probably getting a procurement review when you're new. I understand that. But the information that I'm looking for is for the prior year, but it's information that you should already have. You should already have procurement policies. You should already have a code of conduct. These are things that are generally put out on the board on your uh, school website. Sometimes I can go out there and look at your board documents and I can find the procurement policies there. And then that's when we have a conversation of, of perhaps what language I'm finding that's missing. So these are documents you should have. Uh, your, your 290 fund ledger, that's something that you should already have. And then of course your receipts and your invoices that I you know, will be looking for eventually as we get going in the procurement review. The procurement review is not meant to be frightening. Um, it's actually not that bad. I've talked to a few people lately and I've explained to them what I'm looking for and, and it seems to help. So please, if you're you know, having trepidation, call me. I'm happy to talk to you. I'm happy to walk you through it. I can show you where the documents need to go. Just make sure you're documenting, documenting, documenting. So feel free to call me. My grandkids like me. I'm not such a bad person. So I'm more than happy to help you anytime. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Okay, so we're going to wrap up with me talking about PEBT for this upcoming school year. So USDA did release a memo August 26, 2021, and PEBT this year is going to be close to what it was last year, but there are some nuances. Now, I do want to let everyone know we have not applied for PEBT yet. This is just in case we do apply for PEBT. They must attend an NSLP school. It has to be closed or reduced hours of attendance for five consecutive days. But the next slide will have some of the nuances of the new PEBT for the upcoming year. So the memo 
and I've put in the question numbers 19 and 16 here. So virtual academies, even if administered by a school district, if they are not eligible to participate in NSLP or school breakfast, they are ineligible for PEBT. And virtual days at the virtual academy are not eligible for PEBT if the school attended is a distinct, fully virtual institution. So if you were to have a virtual school that is running um, in a normal year, they would not be qualified to be um, getting NSLP. That is the, the threshold USDA is using. If in a normal year you have a virtual school and virtual schools are not allowed to be on the national school lunch program, then they are not allowed to be on PEBT. The next distinct change is the application rules. If an SFA accepts an application at the start of this year, then you have to use this year's application to determine PEBT eligibility for the family. If you didn't collect an application from a family this year, you can use a 2021 application status. If you have no application for 2021 and a family turns in an application on November 2nd, they are considered free if determined free or reduced. They are considered eligible for PEBT from November 2nd, the date that you received and approved the application forward. USDA is not allowing retroactive benefits this year. That was a one-time only thing. Now I do want to say we are not we have not uh, applied for PEBT yet. Do not upload any lists of schools. We are trying to figure out how to count the days that students are out in a school and with four day and five day week and holidays aren't counted. So it's sort of the same rules. You have to meet five days in order to be eligible. We're trying to figure out how best to um, distribute benefits before we even apply for them if we apply, because now we have to be out doing reviews and we don't know who is going to be in charge of doing PEBT or we need to iron a lot of things out before anything goes forward. I just wanted to let you know about the PEBT application rules, virtual rules, no retroactive benefits, just in case you know of families that didn't it last year because they had no application, um, you may want to uh, let your families know that it's not retroactive this year, it's from the date forward. Just in case you think PEBT um, may be called in if COVID knocks schools out, knock schools out, that's a terrible word. If you are virtual or remote learning at a school that would normally be in person, but they're out because of COVID, these rules are for the 21-22 school year. And with that, we will take any questions that people have. We are um, entertaining any questions, so just yeah. Um, so the first question is: Is the SSO review required each year? So I guess um, to answer the question, we just want to be sure if you're referring to administrative reviews or to the SSO monitoring requirements. Um, if you're referring to the SSO on-site review, it's 
similar to the national school lunch, school breakfast on site, self-monitoring review, which has to be completed by February 1st each school year. Um, if you're refer referring to an administrative review, then that would be on a cycle. And I know that this particular person is up for review this year. So um, if you're referring to your AR, you wouldn't have another AR for five years after your AR this year. Um, next question, we just started with SSO in August. Do we need to do monitoring for the first two months of operation and then another for the rest of the school year? Again, um, the monitoring requirements are really similar to um, National School Lunch Program. You'll just have to do one monitoring form prior to February 1st. Um, will PEBT be based on free and reduced lunch applications? So PEBT, sorry, I'm going to answer that one. PEBT will be based on applications that you received in 2021 or 2122 or those that are directly certified to automatically qualify. So make sure you start pulling your direct cert lists as well. Next question is, where can I find this recording? Um, once we have the recording rendered, it'll be uploaded to our um, Child Nutrition Program YouTube page. And we'll send out a broadcast email once that's posted as well. Next question, one of the slides said that to be part of the PEBT, you must be NSLP. Does that mean SSO is ineligible? No, SSO is actually part of the National School Lunch Program. So if you're operating NSLP, our NSLP or SSO, it, you're eligible, um, granted, if you meet the other qualifications to be a part of PEBT. I would like to confirm that we can still serve meals with parent pickup if our school is out for several days due to COVID and students are virtually learning over those days. All waivers have been submitted. Yes, as long as you've opted into the appropriate waivers, then you're fine to uh, do parent pickup. Um, next question, what is the exact language that lets us know when our product is in the warehouse and has 60 days for us to acquire? Hey, Jessica, I'll go ahead and take that one. Um, what we're talking about is your USDA foods when they're in the warehouse. When, if you're watching your web FCM notifications, they actually tell you when product has been delivered. Also, in the Gold Star Northwest Distribution Inventory Release Software System, which we refer to as IRIS, when your product has arrived, there is actual information that shows you that the product arrival date. And so you need to make sure that you're releasing that product within 60 days. It looks like that was the last question, um, but we'll give it just a few more minutes just in case folks are asking questions. And thank you all for attending the webinar. And we have set up um, additional webinars. And Jess, will you explain that to them? Yeah, so if you registered um, for this webinar, which I'm assuming you did since you are attending, um, you are automatically registered for the rest of the webinars um, coming up for this school year. We're going to be hosting them uh, once a month. And I have a couple, or I have two more questions that popped in. One is thank you for hosting these webinars. You're very welcome. Thank you for attending because if you didn't attend, we wouldn't have them. Um, and then the next question is, is Congress considering universal feeding for school year 22-23. I guess to speak to that, um, I'm not sure of any pending legislation that's currently in Congress. I know that there's been a lot of talk amongst uh, interest groups pushing for universal feeding, um, not for school year 22-23, but making it a permanent uh, part of the National School Lunch Program. But again, I 
at this time, unless anybody else on our team is aware, I'm not sure of any pending legislation regarding universal seating is being considered. Um, okay, is the pallet, oh, it says pallet quantity instead of case. How do we know how much is available? And I'll go ahead and take that one. Um, as far as any questions relative to IRIS and the language in there, please contact Sally Jimenez at Northwest Distribution. Typically, pallet quantity is the same as case quantity, but you may be looking at commercially procured products because if you have a bid with tools for schools, it will also show up in your inventory release software system. So without me knowing exactly what you're looking at, you really need to contact Northwest Distribution and ask them to give you a tutorial on the inventory release software system. All right, now I'm moving to the chat. Um, for the AR questions, which question would you give an extra five points? <laughs> I, um, Jessica, we actually looked at that this morning and by selecting seamless summer option in the um, meal compliance risk assessment tool, it actually does give an additional five points. No way. Okay. Well, there you go. Yes. And not to worry though, because we're aware of that. So please just fill out the um the MCRAT is what we refer to it as. If you're somebody receiving a review that needs to complete that, fill it out with using seamless summer option because that is how you're operating. And TJ, did you want to put in a plug for the Fall Food Expo and your session? Sure. Um, so please don't forget that in October on the 11th, the state agency will be providing five very detailed opportunities to participate in education sessions relative to USDA foods. So we're going to cover a lot of really important information. We'd love to see you there. October 11th, it's a full day of sessions for USDA foods. And thanks for the reminder from our wonderful ISMA folks. And we have a final comment. Thank you for your continuing support. We need all the support we can get, smiley face. And I would like to thank you for all you do because you are school lunch heroes. You're on the ground pivoting, doing pirouettes, everything. Thank you for everything you're doing for the students of Idaho. And with that, it looks like we've answered everyone's questions. Of course, if anything pops up after the webinar, um, we're always here to help you. So feel free to give us a call or an email. And with that, we will see you all next month. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.